did copyrights originate? Copyrights began in the Republic of Venice in the 15th century. Prior to that, printed books were considered part of the public domain. But in 1492, a Milanese author named Donatus Bosius petitioned the sixth Duke of Milan, Gian Galeazzo Soforza, for an exclusive privilege for his book. Bosius argued that without such a privilege, he would be unjustly deprived of compensation for his effort. He was granted a 10-year privilege, and the practice soon spread throughout Europe. The French copyright system was introduced in 1498. Exclusive rights to many types of creative works were granted by the monarch for periods ranging from 2 to 10 years. There were stipulations attached to these early copyrights, sometimes including price controls on the published works. It is important to note, however, that authorship wasn't a requirement for obtaining early copyrights. In fact, the early copyright system of Europe more often than not granted copyrights to printers and publishers, allowing them to establish monopolies over trade in books and other cultural works. This practice seriously limited the diffusion of culture. Early copyright holders may have waxed poetic about authors' rights, but this was often just a way of deflecting public criticism of the monopolies they were establishing. What problems existed in early copyright systems? Early copyright systems also quickly devolved into means of censorship and surveillance. The 1566 Edict of Moulins in France, for example, required that any new book had to be approved and licensed by the Crown before it could be printed. Permission to print could be revoked if officials or influential citizens later complained about the book's content. A decree in 1777 did enable authors who did not sell off their rights to gain a copyright in perpetuity, but the idea of authors' inalienable rights was often nothing more than lofty theory with little application in reality. Because few authors had the capital needed to print a book, they usually had to sell off their exclusive rights to commercial publishers in order to get their work printed. The English copyright system was a similar situation. Copyright law began as a monopoly grant, intended to benefit favored groups and to censor public discourse on behalf of the crown. In 1557, in England, the Worshipful Company of Stationers was granted a royal privilege that enabled it to control the book trade for the next 150 years. It wasn't until 1709 that a new copyright statute, the Statute of Anne, began to break up the monopoly held by the Stationers' Company. The statute stipulated that a copyright could be obtained by anyone, and instead of a perpetual right, the term was limited to 14 years, with the right to renew for one additional 14-year term. According to Professor John Feather of Loughborough University in Britain, the statute wholly ignored the authors of books and certainly was not intended to confer any additional rights on them. Zarina Khan observes that early copyright systems resulted in odious monopolies, higher prices, and greater scarcity, large transfers of money to officials of the crown and their allies, and pervasive censorship, while they also disadvantaged smaller book producers, provincial publishers, and the academic and broader community. How did copyright evolve to protect the rights of authors? It wasn't until 1774 in England, in the landmark case Donaldson v. Beckett, that a court ruled that authors have a fundamental right to their work, at least until publication, after which the Statute of Anne still gave the rights to the publishers. The immediate issue in the case was whether Scottish bookseller Alexander Donaldson had acted as a pirate when he published an edition of James Thomas's The Seasons, a work for which Thomas Beckett and other London booksellers claimed the copyright. However, the larger principle at issue was whether copyright should be a limited right granted by government under the Statute of Anne or a common law right of publishers that existed in perpetuity despite the limitations of the statute. The case would prove pivotal in deciding not only the future of publishing, but also of authors, in whose names the London publishers claimed to be acting. The court extended authors' rights further than the publishers ever intended, however. It reaffirmed the limited statutory nature of copyright and also recognized that authors were the true originators and proprietors of their creative work. As Michel Foucault put it nearly two centuries later, the coming into being of the notion of author constitutes the privileged moment of individualization in the history of ideas, knowledge, literature, philosophy, and science.
In the century after Donaldson versus Beckett, European copyright systems expanded to include sheet music, maps, design, sculpture, and even lectures. The doctrines of work for hire and fair use would emerge, but the law would still remain largely arbitrary, confused, and frequently injurious to the public until the late 19th century. However, the process of transforming copyright from a tool to grant monopoly privileges to publishers into a property right for authors had begun. Thank you.